Yeah, it's been seven years since I got out of prison. Uh, I did four years, and before that, I was addicted to heroin. I led it up to prison, and before that, I was a college kid. They were trying to give me 15 to life for the crime that I committed. 15 to life? I was stressed the f out in there. You decided consciously that you were going to become a better and a different person, and meeting you now, you would never expect that you had this experience. What did you consciously do and focus on in order to become a different person during the hardest of times? I, I knew I had some greater potential, but I had no idea how to even think about getting there. I chose to like not watch the super bowl in there to like watch not watch any of these things because i said i got myself in here like why would i waste any amount of time when this is the precious time that i have to build myself i would love to hear you have somebody like a michael francis or a wes watson mm -hmm. and you feel like they've got the it factor what do you get them to focus on in order to start to build a real audience. The number one underlying factor that is the most important is consistency. My core belief when it comes to content is that there's this, this hunger for that raw, authentic, I wanna see that this person is just like me. What would you suggest as a process for somebody who's building an audience or building a brand in order to start creating content to build an audience that eventually supports their business. There's comes a point in an entrepreneur journey where you have to give up control. Most people just aren't willing to do that work and they're looking at the wrong metrics to say, oh, well, when I get to this point, then my business will grow. No, your business will grow if you just put the work in. My guest today specializes in working with people who are creating content and have very small audiences and he helps them grow that to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers. And the second thing he does is he monetizes those audiences in a way that builds brand and builds authority. So you have a seven figure and sometimes an eight figure business as a result of this process. If you know the name Wes Watson, he is one of the biggest guys in the personal development space. My guest today is one of the people behind the scenes in that business, as well as behind the scenes in a lot of the big names in the personal development space. So the first thing you're gonna learn is how to build and monetize an audience because the people that he works with started with very tiny audiences of just a few hundred or a few thousand people and now they're household names in their industry. The second thing you're gonna walk away with today is you're gonna see that it's not too late. If you are starting over, if you're starting a new chapter, if you feel like you're behind, you're gonna hear Julian's story of how he turned around his life. Just a handful of years ago, Julian was in prison. He talks about how he got there, what it was like, and what his experience was when he got out because he was starting over with nothing. Today, he's the guy behind seven and eight figure businesses. He's the guy that influencers go to when they want to build and monetize their audiences. He has a completely new life and he rebuilt his entire life in just a handful of years. And so I hope you walk away from this knowing that it's not too late, that you're not behind, in just a couple of years, if you put all your attention into building something new, entrepreneurship rewards the person that you become. I find it interesting that Julian made all of his money in the personal development space, but he also did it while developing himself. I think there's something to that. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it, because it's not only a playbook for building and monetizing an audience, but it's also a playbook for completely rebuilding your life. Julian, good to see you, my man. Nice to see you. I like to start these conversations by asking, how did you make your money? Or how do you make your money? How do I make my money? Um, by building businesses behind people with a large following. Um, that's how I started. And from there, just building online businesses, I guess you can kind of sum it up. There. And when you say people with followings, what, what does that mean? Social media audiences. Uh, people who have a strong message. Michael Francis is one. Wes Watson. Uh, we've built behind Bradley Castleberry, Chris Gethin. We no longer work with them anymore. Uh, and Tim Arrigo is our, our newest influencer, I guess you can say. Yeah. I hate that word. That's I hate I, that I, word, I, I too. I avoid it's, it so much. It's funny. <laughs> and I think I think influencers hate that word, too. So, yeah, it's getting to that point. It's oh, very cringy. Audience leaders, content creators, I don't know what we call them. Yeah. But these are people with influence. Cringe, right. And and these, like, I know Francis last I checked, had over a million YouTube followers. Yeah, that was a big milestone and for us. West Wes Watson has well over a million. I'm, I'm not sure how on many. On Instagram, he does. Okay. It's over 500,000 on 
on uh, YouTube. Okay, so you're working with pretty established creators who mm -hmm. have a following. Yeah. And you're doing what with them? Build, we find a way to monetize their audience. So we've started with these guys. This isn't like an influencer agency where we find people who already have a, a very large following and get behind them. My approach was, uh, we can go back to the, the context of how we even got here, but my approach was let's find someone with a really strong message that is polarizing in some way, hmm. that we can attack a niche and be able to build behind them when they have really nothing. So that's exactly what we did. You're looking for the creator before you're looking for the audience. Then. Looking you're looking for the creator. You're looking yeah. for the person who's got it. The person, the, the it factor. It's funny you say that because the one other one of the other people that I really trust in the influencer space is my friend Steve Dudian, who does the same thing. Is he looks for not the person with a million followers. He's looking for the person with 10 or 8. But he's like, I just know when they've got it. Mm -hmm. So, Julian, how would you describe it? For me, the it factor is, well, it was characterized by uh, the polarizing message, like a line in the sand. This is who it's for. This is who it's not for. I like to see that someone has haters, that someone has a something that it can only resonate with a very specific type of person. Um, where it's different, it just stands out. I, I, I would say it, it might even be a more of like an internal feeling that I kind of get. Okay, I'm like oh, this person has it. Um, but those were the initial characteristics, and then as that developed, now I start adding on to the it factors. Like, okay, is this person coachable? Is this person going to be willing to um, heed to the advice, or 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 at least give up some control and, and leadership when we're trying to build something together? And that was something that I didn't look for at the beginning, but it added to the it factor uh, long term. So let's talk about an example. So we've got somebody like Michael Francis, who I'm not super familiar with his content, but he's a mob boss or was a mob boss. And I think the most successful person in the mob. And so that's an interesting story right away. You're like, this is compelling. Uh, what did you notice about someone like that, that you said, okay, I can build a business around this person? That story is incredible. And seeing that there was nothing out there that was speaking on this story in this way, he didn't really have a following at all. And what what, what was his following when you started working with him? It was 30,000 on Instagram and no YouTube. Okay. So pretty I'm, like, I'm pretty dude. small. I mean, for for reference, I consider I think I have a fairly small audience in the global sphere of entrepreneurship. And I have more than 30,000 Instagram followers, right? I've been doing it for years and years and years. So that's that, that gives people like me some hope that, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. all right. So that's not nothing. It's not, it's not nothing. nothing. It's so not nothing. you saw this person with 30,000 followers doing content that you thought, what was it about the polarizing nature of it? Or was it just so unique? What did you, what did you see? I'm trying to find what, what gives you that eye for knowing that, somebody could break out yeah so with michael i saw that he the only thing he had he wasn't even really creating content I mean, he was speaking around the world so that was his form of content is in person old school i'm like dude there's something here right in terms of like i'm already seeing the, the monetization uh abilities to to be able to take this somewhere right and the only other thing that he had online was an interview with Patrick Pet David at that time, that was, I think it was Patrick's largest interview during that time. It was like, it got to like 11 million views. Mm, I remember that interview. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And they did it twice. Um, but that was it. That's, that was the, his only footprint on online at that time. So I said, at the very least, we can at least monetize on YouTube. And uh, the way we came about this this relationship was, was it all started through Wes a little bit. So somebody Wes Watson, yeah, someone reached out to him because um, he was getting constant attention, and a mutual friend that this person had was Michael. So we ended up, long story short, they were trying to do something uh, together. That that friend and um, we ended up starting that. It was like a nonprofit for for um, 
in the addiction space started with their social media and kind of getting them on ramped. And I guess Michael was supposed to be the face of that. And at that time I said, Hey, Michael, like you have nothing else going on here. Like, why don't we start with building your personal brand first? Cause that will be more of like an, an equity play for you. So you can do more of these type of things. Yeah. And that's where it kind of just cascaded from there. And we, we look to, to launch different online communities, different online products and, with Michael, it started to expand more into um, Netflix documentaries. We did a documentary with uh, Sammy the Bull. Um, it was called Mafia States of America okay. with, with uh, Valuetainment. So that was a really cool project. We ended up doing a, an NFT launch. So it, it really got into a different sphere with Michael because he was more almost like a mainstream type of person. Because of his story. Because like of his he had, story. He had the potential to be <laughs> mainstream, but he certainly wasn't mainstream when you met him. I certainly so, wasn't, yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing you say that he had 30,000 followers, mostly off the back of a, a YouTube series a that YouTube he did series. on a big channel, but he mm -hmm. wasn't creating a lot of content. And you told me that when you started working with Wes Watson, he had 5,000 followers. Yeah. On, just on YouTube, on right? On Instagram. On ins oh, my goodness. He didn't have YouTube. So, wow okay yeah. so we're seeing a theme here which is that people who have a message they meet julian and then they pop <laughs> then then they blow up could be coincidence partially sure yeah. it could be you're so <laughs> humble but but i would love to hear you have somebody like a michael francis or a wes watson mm -hmm. and you feel like they've got the it factor what do you get them to focus on in order to start to build a real audience because these these are some of the top guys in, we'll just say the masculine personal growth space. Right. So what are you getting them to double down on in order to start to see that growth? You know, it's funny because during that time, I was shooting from the hip. I just knew there was an opportunity. And I said, the number one thing that we can do is just be consistent. So at the very least, let's just get onto YouTube because we know that YouTube was going to be the king for long form content, telling a story and building community. I always believed in YouTube as being like that leader. So I said, let's just get you on YouTube and start telling your story. Just share the all of the, the you know, intimate details, every, um, you know, raw, authentic story that you can come up with. We gave a little bit of guidance there, but it's mostly like run with it and let's stick to a shotgun approach and see what we what's going to stick and after we find some things that stick then we can start nailing the theme and tripling down on that so we can we stuck with at least three uh three videos posting per week and that was the foundation is like just tell your story and let's stick to three times a week so and it was with really just them I, I, I follow Wes's content loosely and I know that for a while he was just firing up the MacBook and recording mm -hmm. eight minute videos three times a week mm -hmm. and they were kind of grungy and in some cases they still are yeah. it's just him you know yelling in front of the 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 MacBook or his heart times. out yeah is that what you mean by just tell your story find your talking points and just see what starts to come up and what starts to to stick for for those early stages when we we're getting started that's exactly what it was and i mean it's, it's definitely shifted uh and there's a little bit more of a, a strategic approach when it, that we've implemented with beyond driven but with them that's all it was and you said youtube was you could see that that was the play would you say that's still the play today absolutely really yeah. you said that with confidence tell me why yeah youtube is the best place to build community it's the absolute best way to build community. Um, it's, 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 uh, TikTok is starting to take over for the search engine part, which is crazy because YouTube is, is part of Google, but it, it's, it's tail, you know, head to head when it comes to that. And I, I just think that I've also grown, you know, launched on, on TikTok and grown, uh, to almost a million followers on TikTok with, with Beyond Driven and comparing that audience to, YouTube monetization is better on YouTube and the overall consistency in the way that that you can go deep with an audience and, and really truly build a community on YouTube is it's it's far not I mean Facebook is starting to kind of get back they're up trying there. yeah it's getting back up there like we have over I think 
close to 200,000 followers with Beyond Driven on Facebook, which was like a surprise. You keep mentioning Beyond Driven. Could you explain what, what that is? Yeah, so Beyond Driven is my other company that uh, primarily focuses on helping men who are struggling with their marriage. That's kind of like the start, but the mission is, is really to democratize a lot of the therapy tools and resources to give that back to the people. So any internal struggles that you're, you're really facing, you can use those same tools that the therapy industry uses on their clients for yourself. And it's started out exclusively with, exclusively with helping successful men overcome the struggles that they're facing in their marriage. But the marriage is really the mirror. It's the point of uh -huh. adversity that causes you to look within yourself. And you can hide a lot from the world, but you can't hide much from your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want I didn't expect to go in this direction this early. Yeah, but, well, but, we can circle back. But, but this that. this is this <laughs> this is exciting. So I'm I'm gonna ask you for personal advice here. Okay. Because yeah. I obviously YouTube is where we put our content consistently once or twice a week. And then we turn that over to the podcast, we turn that into clips. And my audience is still fairly small. We've grown a lot in the last year and a half or so. I'm really proud of the content that we put out. Yeah. Hundreds of millionaires created as a result of our content. But we don't we don't see Wes Watson style growth. Mm -hmm. Do I need to be more polarizing? Do I need to be more consistent? What advice would you have for me and people like me? You might have to test some different things. Um, I wouldn't look at michael and and wes in your case i would look more to alex ramosa because alex was that type of person that grew so fast in a business niche so it's like what is what is alex doing because he doesn't have a polarizing story yes he's made a lot of money but it's um it's still business content it's not normally exciting so looking at like okay what is what is what are the clips and the way that he's editing these things that is making it more engaging because it's all about you know view time and and just yeah. what are people engaged with and, and what are they tuning into and just finding those things and tripling down on that that but that style is wildly different from a wes watson for example wildly different. wes watson does no editing he no does editing. no screen motion he does he has no slides he just gets up there and talks, right? So how do you how do you understand or explain that difference? Where Wes does a he has a lot of personal growth content, but it's also a lot of money content. We'll say not necessarily business content, but money content. Yeah. And Hormozy does the same thing. And then you've got Meet Kevin, who is just he's he's business and finance, but he's just him in front of his computer. So how do you explain the differences between these audiences, but they all seem to work? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting when you say that is uh, another person that comes to mind too that's, that's raw, authentic, no cuts is Sam Sulek, who grew really fast in the bodybuilding industry. He's like a, he just does the long workouts, right? And he's just so raw and just like a likable personality. And I think that that's something that you, you can't really imitate. Mm. You know, there's some people just, that just naturally have like a, a, a personality that people are attracted to, like a magnetizer. Not to, it's not a shot at you, but, um, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not that cool. Sorry, you're not that cool. I'm funny, I'm handsome, uh, yeah, but I'm I'm kind of boring. Okay, <laughs> got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um. But I, I think that there's just like a certain type of personality that that people just um, are more magnetized by. And, and I'd say when it comes to, you know, even between Wes and Michael, those are two very different things. Michael's very articulate and there's more like a mystique about yeah. his story He's overall. very polished. Very polished. But it's also like, man, this guy is a mob boss. Like, 10 years 20 years ago would you ever think that a fucking mob boss would be on youtube telling you know the ins and outs like that's just it's it's so like the concept of that story is just so like crazy to think about you know but when it comes to west yeah there's there's now it's a there's a growing prison niche there's a lot of guys who are coming forward and telling their stories which we kind of started that niche um 
but with Wes, it's his his polarizing, hard hitting message. It really draws the, the line in the sand of like, this is who it's for, and this is who it's not for, and he's not afraid to call you a bitch, and huh. that's where people just love that because he's so raw, unfiltered, and gritty that people love like they they kind of there's a part of them that just want that fire yes then i think yeah, that's, that's right that's what it is it's like ah like there's that part of me that you're speaking to that i i suppress i completely understand what you're saying and i'm able to attach my like suppressed identity to this person that is so confidently speaking the things that i never can imagine speaking yeah, I only agree with Wes maybe 44.6% of the time, <laughs> but he speaks with such conviction and I I covet that conviction. I can I covet that fire. And so when I when I listen, that part of me comes alive. That's how I would describe the it factor. That some part of me comes alive mm -hmm. as a result of just being in the circle of this person, which is also in from a from a content consumption perspective it can be tempting or alluring to mistake that feeling that comes awake with the information that is being delivered. And I think that's when we can get into hero worship of influencers. It's like, I feel something when I'm around this person or I listen to this person, and therefore I'm going to mistake the information for this feeling that I have. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's no better example of this than Donald Trump. I mean, mm. I mean most Republicans now have opinions they didn't have 10 years ago because they're not Republican ideas because they it's he spoke directly to a suppressed part of that wing of the party that came alive. And now I'm going to attach those feelings, that information. I'm just having that realization for the first time. But but when you talk about it in the context of West, that makes sense to me is that part comes alive. Stokes the fire. That's right. That's right, and there, um, there, from a from a personal standpoint, there need there needs to be an awareness of where I put that fire, right? I have to be I have to be conscious about where I'm going to put that energy. So, are you saying that when you can see the it factor, you're hoping to unlock and package that fire, that conviction, that message, and put it out there? and then see what is hitting and resonating, and then you're starting to come up with the themes of content that you're gonna build around. Is that a fair summary of what you're looking yeah, for? Fair summary of what I'm looking for, exactly. It's like, you run with it, and I'm gonna figure out how I can, you know, package it up in, yeah. in the right way, and to com uh, compartmentalize the different themes that I find that might be resonating most with an audience. Yeah, I know you didn't come here for a personal consult, but but <laughs> we we have this interesting dilemma or balance uh, in our company where I know that if I talk about building e-commerce brands all day, every day, we'll sell more memberships, we'll hit our target audience, and we'll grow. And I can do that for a while, and I can do that consistently. But if it's all I talk about, I feel like I'm dying inside. And so there is this part of me that want that I, and I haven't been able to suppress it anymore. It's just starting to come out that has to talk about politics, religion, economics, personal growth. It's like, it's almost been suppressed so long that it's like, I'm like vom starting to vomit it up. Like I can't keep it in anymore. But how, how do you create consistency around a topic or a theme that is going to build a business versus unlocking and unleashing what would be a personal brand where you're just throwing random things all over the place? You know, some people like a Gary Vee approach is more like just talk about things and see what happens. But then you have the approach of just like, shut up and dribble, like do, do your thing, keep doing your thing, talk about it for a long time, hit your talking points, hit your audience. And you, you, I don't hear you saying either of those extremes. So how do you think about those two different approaches? You know, there is definitely a balance between those, I would say, um, because the number one underlying factor that is the most important is consistency, whether it's it's consistent to a theme or it's just uh, honestly, it's just being consistent on on a platform. On creating. Yeah. You know, you just have to be consistent with creating. 
and the rest will kind of follow because my my core belief when it comes to content is that people buy from people at the end of the day so your personal brand is personal you should share the personal aspects mm. of it and even if you don't have a polarizing message your your views your beliefs your values those are going to be polarizing regardless of if you want want it to be or not there's going to be people that align with your beliefs and there's going to be people that just don't like what you have to say when it comes to certain topics and they might you know get mad in the in the comments and say you should stick to this and that yeah. it's like yeah. well this is my channel so you can yeah you know <laughs> you can peace out and kick rocks <laughs> yeah, i've actually I, this is a recent example so it's fresh in my mind but um when i think about a live market update i think about meet kevin because he does i think daily market updates so when something interesting is going on that's a person that i think of that's a theme for him but recently he did a video where he his wife had triplets and one of them was going into surgery or having a super personal video and i watched the whole thing and it added like a different layer to this personality that was just interesting and I would have never followed the content for that, but it gave a different depth of connection to that human experience. And it didn't make me go to his market updates less often. And it just gave me a different level of appreciation for the human being. And so that's kind of how I'm processing what you're saying of you have these themes, but there's still room for that personal or that random idea to just come out and see what happens. Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, I think that's that's ultimately what makes YouTube so special and why this influencer space has grown so much is that it's it's that behind the scenes, it's that building in public that people really uh, gravitate towards. They're, everyone's tired of, of the, the staged stuff, even though we still see it you know, a lot, but I think that there's this, this hunger for that raw, authentic, I, I, I want to see that this person is just like me and that I can attach that part. Like I, I, it makes it more real. It makes it more in touch. Like they're, they have, they struggle, they go through different things. They have, you know, ups and downs in life. And so do I, you know, and I, I can, I can attach to their story and I also love their success. So it just adds that <clears throat> that reality to this person. When I started my podcast, it was 2013. And I simply accepted every podcast invite, didn't miss a week. And I said, and I didn't have like a, a plan or a process. I just said I was finding my talking points. I was just figuring out what came up a lot. What did people ask a lot? What seemed to hit? What shows hit? What were people saying in the comments? And then I was able to start to find where people started to appreciate my work. I kind of got locked into that for I felt too long, those talking points. And that's what I mean now. I feel like I'm breaking out of that. That was, But that was my process for finding my first talking points and building my audience. What would you suggest as a process for somebody who's building an audience or building a brand in order to start creating content to build an audience that eventually supports their business? And you have nothing and that you're starting from zero. Let's say that. Yeah. I mean, you started with a guy with 5,000 followers who now is one of the leaders in the space. So that's yeah. basically nothing. <laughs> right. Um, you know, for someone, I ask myself the same question because I, I'm in the process of starting my own coming back from from under, you know, everyone else and starting my own. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've been the ops guy, the behind the, 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 behind behind the scenes, scenes yeah. person. So I'm, I'm finally stepping forward and and, and going to be starting my own thing. And I ask myself the same questions like, where do we where do we start? It's like it, it, it's different to build for someone than it is to build for yourself. Yeah. Because sometimes you're too close to the label to, to read it, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, when I when I'm thinking about this whole process, it's. I always like to start with the origin story. It's always starting with like who, how did you get to where you are to, to want to do the things that you are either doing currently or intend to do. And that there's a lot of beliefs that are hidden in those. And I think that it always goes back to that, that thing. It's like beliefs and values is what really creates an audience. Hmm. And if you can... Could you explain what you mean by that? The beliefs and values? Because 
I believed for a long time, and I think a lot of people believe that it's the content and the information that builds audience. So what do you mean that beliefs and values? Well, the content and the, and the information is, that's like the external, right? So that is all going to still be uh, the product of the foundation beliefs and values. Because you wouldn't say something if you don't believe it, unless you're telling a lie. But it's it's really understanding, like, what are those things that you believe in and what are those things that you value? And then the, the intersection there. And there's going to be people that resonate with those things. And there's going to be people that have a contradictory belief. Huh. And they might have an opposing belief. And when they have an opposing belief, that's what creates that, that line in the sand. Because they're going to be like, ah, that person... I don't believe what he says. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't agree with those things, but those are all at the, the foundational element of that is a belief or it's a value. Right? So, so let's, let's play with this for a second. Cause I'm having a brain gasm as you're saying this. <laughs> so one of the beliefs that I hold dear is that over time things get better. And that's a, that's a belief. That's a value. Like I live my life on that, that over time things tend to get better. Whether like no matter how hard I try, the world is still going to get better in, in, in if you look at the macro of it. And so if an event like a war happens or a pandemic, if I come at it through that belief and I'm talking about the tragedies that are happening but I'm looking at it from a long-term optimistic view, that by nature is polarizing. It is polarizing. Because in the short term, it hurts. In the short term, there's pain. In the short term, there's loss and grief. But if we're looking at it from a long-term view, there's always innovation that comes out of pain. That is by nature polarizing, but I believe it to be true. Even if it doesn't feel true to me, I still like believe it. It's still a core value. And that gives a unique perspective. And I think one of the themes that could come out of that belief is that there is like a a, a long-term optimistic view of this guy, of this yeah. capitalism.com guy. Is that an example of what you mean by the beliefs and values? That's exactly okay. it. And, you know, when you even uh, um, unfold that a little bit more is how would you make your audience feel from that belief? Uh, you know, who is it, your audience? And like when, when you create that content that has that core belief, what are they going to ultimately feel like at the end of the day? Is it hope restored? Possibly, I would think yeah. so. Is it people that are looking for that type of hope that they can attach to that belief that they ultimately believe, but they're just like, it's shaky right now? And they're looking for someone that has that aligned value. And that's, you're, you're kind of creating that source for them to gravitate toward. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. That's beautiful. One of my goals for this year is to grow this YouTube channel by creating content that has no ask that has no call to action, that has no result associated with it for selling courses or programs, just creating amazing content that my community needs. The one ask that I do have is that if you're getting value out of this show, would you hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening or watching this episode? It helps me go out and have leverage with the people that I know can serve you. I like bringing the entrepreneurs to you that are getting their fingernails dirty and don't have huge platforms so that you can learn from them first. It helps me do that if you hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast player or on YouTube. And that helps us go out and get the guests that I know create the most value for you on your road to 1 million. You mentioned starting with the origin story and your origin story is very interesting and compelling because you were not always running the backend operations for big influencers who are now famous in the internet marketing space. I don't know how many years it was that you were completely starting over and not starting over with your last 2 million. I mean, like <laughs> really starting over. So could you walk us back, what, six or seven years? Yeah, it's been seven years since I got out of prison. Uh, I did four years or three and a half, just to be exact, uh, in prison. And before that, I was addicted to heroin. I led it up to prison. And before that, I was a college kid. <laughs> hmm. College to heroin to prison. To prison. Yeah. So I don't know where you want to take that. <laughs> <but> we... <laughs> uh, well, first of all, when we know there's different types of prison, right? There's like, if, if, you, if you remember the movie Office Space, okay, they, they talk about there's 
there's white collar prison where you have conjugal visits and lots of outside time and you play pickleball. And then there's federal pound me in the ass prison. <laughs> so <laughs> which, which type of prison were you in? Well, I was in state and it was, uh, I pound me in the ass, <laughs> time, but, uh, that sounds very, uh, very gay. But <laughs> uh, it was definitely not, none of that happened, but it was, it was a, a hardcore California state prison, uh, for people that do violent crimes. Um, I did have conjugal visits because I got married in jail. You got married in jail to a woman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification, Julian. We all had doubts going into this call. Uh, so, um, well, that derailed me just a little. So, so you, you're in federal state prison, but these are these are not federal state state. Did I say federal state? Yeah. <laughs> these these are these are not your federal white collar crimes. No, this is right? violent criminals who are doing burglaries, robberies, murder. Um, yeah, what, violent. Stuff. What was your cell like? Uh, so the way that that it goes is you go to jail first, you get sentenced, whatever. I was in jail for eighteen months. Uh, fighting my case they were trying to give me 15 to life for the crime that i committed 15 to life yeah i i robbed someone um and kidnapped them um put them in my car and held a gun to their face they kicked me in the, kicked me in the face so i pistol whipped them and it's crazy i only got three and a half years um but thank mm. god um but anyway fought the case for 18 months hired and where are you being lawyers. held for 18 months this is in in county jail so it's um there's like 50 beds in the county jail that i every county jail is a little bit different but the one that that i was at was there were like pods so it's it's like a it's like a big summer camp <laughs> with a bunch of criminals that <laughs> you know just the beds everywhere you know there's like two stories and just bunk beds next to each other so you're basically you're basically like in barracks yeah, yeah exactly. you're, so you're, you're yeah. in like a 50 person barrack a 50 person barracks that's exact that's a great way to explain it um yeah and that jail was jail is very difficult i say jail is probably harder than than prison uh it's just different like there's there's different challenges on, on both sides but jail i think the there's a lot more to worry about in jail and is that because you're in such close quarters with other criminals it's more of like when you get to prison you can get your it's called programming so like you're you're uh, just hey i'm here and i'm gonna be here for the next however many years and you have to worry about riots and you know the all the same type of things that you have to worry about but in jail you have a lot of people who are coming in and out and the cops are ruthless sometimes like the the cops who it, it's it's almost like they get punished when they get punished inside of the um whatever cop world <laughs> they're like you're gonna go do your jail time and, and be the the, the jail cop so they come in here and you get like the worst of them and they're just fucking assholes you know they're and what that means is that two o'clock in the morning you're all your shit is getting tossed and you're out in the the yard area this small yard in county jail which is not like a prison yard and you're out in there and your boxers stripped down in the freezing cold and while they're you know just mm. strip searching and and going through all your shit so jail can be very very tough in, in that regard and there's just a lot of um people who are going in and out so people who are committing small crimes so you don't have this consistency in the tank some people would bring drugs in through their prison pocket <laughs> their asshole and um, <clears throat> it just causes uh, a lot of issues. You know, some people with bad paperwork that they might be in there for for a rape or you know some type of sexual charge, uh, they get thrown in, whether that's intentional by the cops or whatever, and that causes problems in the tank. And it's just there's a lot of drama that can come with with uh, with being in jail. And then you also are still going to court. So every two months that or sounds exhausting. whatever, you have to wake up early and you're you're in this holding cell just waiting for your time. So you have no certainty at all. So you're you're still fighting your that's, case. That's so, yeah, that's you have people part. coming in and out all the time. You're just always stressed. 
You have no predictability. Mm -hmm. Things can go haywire at any time. So you're just on alert. You're on alert all the time. All the time. Yeah, that's the worst part about jail. So I think that that's why people try to like speed through that process. And if if they know they're going to prison, like you should take a plea. But I'm like, there's no way I was going to take a plea for Mm. for 10 plus years. Uh, Because that was one of my first offers. Like you can take a plea deal for 10 years. I'm like, I thought about it. I'm like, oh, 10 years. It's like. They wanted me to take two strikes in 10 years. Two strikes. And I was 21 years old, which is crazy to think about. Um, and I almost took it, but I really sat on it. I said, nope, I'm just going to keep fighting, which is very dangerous when they bring up the the life sentence. So, like, I was just, I was stressed the fuck out in there. Like, it was just, man, to the point where my body, when I got, when I ended up getting to prison, um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Mm. So my mom had Crohn's disease, but I I tend to believe that it's can be dormant in your body and then sh- there's stress and environmental factors that kind of bring it out of, of course. you. And um, that just made my whole prison experience that much di- more difficult. So when I got to prison... <clears throat> but, well, well, first of all, how did so how did you get it reduced from 10 to three and a half? What lawyers happened? i mean just just fighting it and man it was um every judge that was uh in that uh district they were like oh yeah this is 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus there's the the um the initial judge that did my arraignment was like her name is judge nichols she pointed at me she's like i'm gonna make an example out of you I'm like oh god <laughs> and this is like three days into jail i've never been to jail before this and um i'm just like fuck this is this is not good and not really knowing what that path in front of me looked like but i'm like this is gonna be a long flight and uh luckily my my lawyers they just kept we kept fighting and um we happened to get a guest judge or one of my pre-arraignment, uh, or, or I forgot what it's called. It's been a while. But one of the um, uh, court dates that we had before sentencing, and the district attorney, he wasn't really budging that much, but he knew that w- he didn't really think that this was going to be a life case. He just wanted to kind of up, you know, have more leverage. It's it's all it's all a game of leverage in in, uh, in that world. We happened to get a guest judge <clears throat> that was from a different county. He looked at it. He had, saw my ref, character reference letters. He saw that I was doing college in jail. And um, he just looked that I, ha- I had no background history or anything like that. Obviously, it's a tough crime. But he decided to give me five with good time. With all mm. the time that I did in jail, he added that to to the prison sentence. So it was like a, five a, years. a total five year sentence and you, had already, and you were in, had already been in jail for a year and a half. Mm-hmm. So then you go to prison. Mm-hmm. What is that like? Get to prison and um, an important detail here is that I'm, I'm mixed. So I'm black and white. My dad is black. My mom is white. And uh, on the, the, on the streets, um, I hung out with everyone, but mostly, mostly black. Uh, during that time and that that was like my like my core identity uh, is being mixed even though I don't look mixed so when I got in there well I got in jail I chose to run black and um, you have to pick a side Mm. and uh, that adds a lot of complexity when you get to prison uh, because there's a lot of skinheads there's Aryan Brotherhood and they don't like to see anybody that doesn't fit they're just very particular like oh you you stick out like a sore thumb um so my prison experience started off with me getting out of that bus going from county to to prison and you stand in this line your boxers or not in the boxers yet they're always trying to see you naked um (laughs) so you're standing in line waiting for to like go into like this registration area yeah, and this is at reception. This is in uh, Tracy uh, DVI, and um, you get up to your the. There's like a sergeant, and there's um, 
there's like an inmate that's like passing out your your clothes and like your 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 fish kit is what it's called, like your toothbrush and uh, envelopes for for letters and things like that. <clears throat> and they ask you about your gang affiliation. They ask you what your race is. They ask you all these things. And right when I say that I'm black, he like like the whole time, everyone he's just like you know writing, just kind of going through the flow, whatever. Right when I say I'm black, he just like paused everything and he just like looked at me. He was like, and then he went and got his lieutenant and they're like, here, get your stuff and you're going to go talk to the lieutenant. Like they were terrified. And I was like, oh my gosh, here we go. It was like all my fear is about like, I knew that this was going to come at some mm. point that I might have to, uh, to kind of face the music. And this was the decision that was like, do I, you know, go protective custody or do I go general pub, uh, general population? And I didn't want to go uh, protective custody because that means that you're just, you might get housed with some rapists, some child molesters, and I just, I can't do that. I'd rather take whatever is coming to me with fighting and, and knives. And I'm like, let's just, let's just hope for the best and hope that my people have my back and that we're just going to, if it comes down to a riot or whatever, my people have my back, and if I get stabbed, hopefully I just don't die. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so that's kind of like the attitude you have to approach, like going into those situations. And um, and I'm a big dude. Like I'm not. Some of these other guys that come in here, they're just like these little white boy gangsters, and they got their little cornrows, and it's just a different situation. Like I don't. It's just it's different. Uh, so anyway, when I got there. I talk to the lieutenant, she sits me down and she's just looking me in the face. She's like, you know what you're, you're doing right now, right? We just had uh, a white crip get removed by three, um, three Aryan Brotherhood guys in this yard and he's in critical condition. This happened two weeks ago and this has been happening for the past year. They're, they're mm. taking this very seriously. So I want you to be fully informed of what decision you're making right now. I'm in the office and I'm like sweating. I'm like, first of all, I'm mixed. So I'm not a regular white guy. I had a big ass fro at this time. And uh, so there was that. And then she's like, okay, well, you're, are you, uh, are you a blood? Are you a, a Zilla? Are you, you know, she started naming like Sacramento gangs. And I'm like, no, I'm not affiliate. I'm not affiliate. I'm a college kid and I'm good. Like, I'm going to be fine. And that's it. And you don't talk to the police. Like I was, you get hardened during those times. So like, I, I was just ready. I was like, I was accepting my fate for what it was. And you know, this is the life that I chose during this time. And you have to just accept all the consequences that come with that. So I said my piece, they put me in the, the holding tank and you're just waiting there for all day. Like basically, yeah, it's like a whole day you're just sitting and sitting and sitting and waiting to go to your cell. So they finally called me like eight hours later, something like that. Um <clears throat> grab my stuff and I go back, I go to my my cell and I'm walking. And every uh every CO is just like they're looking at you yeah, like you they're have looking no at me like you have no idea. So this whole time, I'm like, man fuck these guys. Like I started to get mad. Like they, they don't know me. Like, I don't give a fuck. Fuck you. You know, that was the attitude that I had to just like embrace. You just have, it's either you're going to bitch up or you're going to just man the fuck up and get ready for war. Man, I'm just thinking about the guy listening to this episode in his car about influencer marketing. He's like, <laughs> I did not see this coming. I did not <laughs> expect this episode to go in this direction. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it definitely took a sorry for it. steve <laughs> right uh, uh yeah i don't know if you talked about this with dan martell or not but <laughs> i'm sure he has some stories too <laughs> so it's so like how so how were you treated overall over those three and a half years that was great. I mean, we. It was it, great. <laughs> oh, I skipped to the end. Yeah, it was no, great. No, it was. It was. I got in, married. I studied. In terms of like the people treating me, I, I was. I, I got the respect that you, you give respect. You you know, you you'll get respect. 
And that's it. And they saw that I tr like I was true to who I was. Like I was a college kid. I was non affiliate. I was not trying to be in the bullshit. I was staying out of the way. I was going to church. I was doing all the things that I need to be, you know, to get the fuck out of here and to not turn back. You decided to become a better person. I decided to become a better person. And when people see that, they they respect that because huh. they're like, he's not in the bullshit. He's not doing drugs. He's not, you know, all in the mix and trying to be in the the you know the drama and like prove himself and lead with ego and like oh yeah 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 fuck that guy blah 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 like no i was a i was a fucking man and i just you only have your word and your balls you know that's that's all i had so it's like i'm gonna speak whatever i'm speaking that's what i'm i'm backing you know that's my foundation you're obviously you work with wes watson now but you you didn't go to prison with wes watson no he tells a slightly different story where he was in prison and he was deciding to become a better person, but there was still violence. There was still fights. There was still shit going on. Did you have the same experience or were you so focused on getting better that you removed yourself from that? No, there's, there's a lot that you can't avoid. I mean, a lot. There's... I would say that our experiences were a little bit different because he was a, a Peckerwood. Peckerwood is like an, a prison gang. Like inside, there's they operate a little bit different. They're more militant compared to to the brothers, to the blacks. Like it's laid back. We're chilling. Like unless there's an issue between races, like you can most for the most part, uh, stay out of it. There might be some internal conflicts where someone tries to press you and, and you know, kind of test your gangster is what we call it. Uh, that didn't really happen. There wasn't really an opportunity that, you know, really arose where I was kind of put into that position. I mean, there was some conflict. Like, I'm not going to say I haven't gotten into conflicts. I definitely gotten into a few fights in jail, uh, gone into to one fight in prison. Um, but for the most part, you stay out of it. And as long as you get back on track and you're just doing your thing, like people will respect it and just kind of keep their peace. But again, there's, there's still fights everywhere. There's violence all the time. There's drugs. There's people who are, uh, who need to be removed from, mm. from yards for maybe they're stealing from someone or whatever it is. So you'll see two on ones, three on ones, stabbings, riots, a lot of shit happens that you can't really avoid, but you you do your best to, to stay out of it as much as possible. You decided consciously that you were going to become a better and a different person. And meeting you now, you would never expect that you had this experience. You are like you're kind, you're open hearted, you're giving, you are humble. That's not what you would associate with somebody who went through an experience like this. So what did you consciously do and focus on in order to become a different person during the hardest of times? There were a few books that I read early on in jail that it it hurt, like it just, it, it got me to the core. So when I started to kind of lift the fog. Of, well, first, what were, what were the books? <laughs> so there was a Thinking Big. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that was that was one of the biggest books that that really opened my eyes um, to just the possibility of more, right? Um, the the uh, seven habits of highly effective yeah. people. Um, what else was it? And where do you? How do you get books in prison? Someone has to send them in, or they, okay. there's like a very small library, but. Uh, mostly my mom was, was sending me books in and my, my wife, my now wife, uh, was sending me a lot of books and commissary and stuff like that. Um, so the first thing you're doing is you're just changing the way you're thinking, changing the way I was thinking by, by reading was, was the very first thing. And that reading was what really opened my eyes to what's possible and to thinking big, thinking in ways that I've never thought about ever. So that is like what really sparked that just inner fire of like, I, I knew I had some greater potential, but I had no idea how to even, 
think about getting there. I'm right? re I'm really glad you said that, and 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 this is hitting me at a time where I, I was just on a uh, this like a short weekend trip, and I was walking through the airport and just noticing how everyone's overweight, and everyone has their nose in their phone, and everyone is grump. Like this is the airport I was in was just I just noticed that there was like this collective mm -hmm. unwellness and so much of I think the reason why we as human beings have gotten into this place where now 70% of people are overweight or obese and unhappy is we have drowned out all the space to just read good things and and we have we have our nose on TikTok looking at what other people have or what shitty thing somebody else did and we're judging the world and we have no, we give ourselves no space to pause and think differently think in a way that somebody else has consciously sat down to share with the rest of the world and and i think about my transformative years usually i was going through a hard time and i sat down and i read something that made me think differently mm. and you're saying exactly the same exactly that yeah and you know it started with more of those mindset entrepreneur type of books but then i started expanding into psychology and um some of the books by um ben carson about mm. the brain and it it just made me so a little bit angry at myself for treating my brain the oh, way that I've been treating it up to that point. And then I also started thinking about like all the pain that I put on my mom and then seeing that all these so-called friends that I had up to that point, no one was writing me, no one was coming to visit me. So you really start to just think about life from a whole different perspective and you start to, you know, think about what's possible and what really matters. And, you know, it always really just started with that. And when I got to pre after doing that for a year, I would, I would challenge myself, like how many books can I read in this time of me being in, in, in jail? And then, um, you know, I, I would challenge myself every week. Like, okay, can I read a book a week and get to that point? Mm. I, I got to a book a week. So I just was constantly feeding myself with, with just different perspectives and information. And I started to get a little bit bored of like the the mindset stuff, and I wanted more like tactical stuff. So I started reading uh, information on sales and and uh, getting into school. And when I had something to really focus on accomplishing, that just made me tune out a lot of the the BS. So in prison, while everyone's watching movies or they're watching you know TV, watching sports, I made this internal promise to myself to just dedicate to to school. And because like it's stuck, you with gave me yourself to, a worthy goal. Yeah. And I, I just, it stuck with me to that point where I don't even watch sports anymore, like to this day, because it just became such a habit. It became so ingrained in myself that I chose to like not watch the Super Bowl in there, to like watch, not watch any of these things because I said, I got myself in here. Like, why would I waste any amount of time when this is the precious time that I have to build myself? And that's what I chose to do. And and I, I really focus on just school and, and education as much as possible. It's really empowering to hear that you just gave yourself that window to work on yourself. And so I, I have shared the story before. Um, someone that I did quite a bit of business with was convicted of a white collar crime. And we did a decent amount of business together. And I... I was afraid that I was going to be somehow involved in the crime, even though I had no like knowledge or, or anything because we did work together. I've heard stories of my peers going to jail or prison just because of their association with somebody. And so I had that fear. And when the FBI calls, yeah, that's a scary call. And I, you know, I, I worked with them and I was never considered a, a suspect. I was always considered a victim because I lost all, at the time it was my largest investment went with this crime. And I called a, a friend who had been incriminated in a crime and he gave me almost the same advice. He's like, if it gets that to that, you use that space to get better. And I 
I, I came to this place, Julian, where I finally asked myself the question, if I go to prison and I lose my reputation, I lose all my money and I lose my freedom, can I find peace and happiness? And I concluded that I could. I concluded that I could find it in that space. And, and when I found out I was not under any investigation at all, I thought that I would then treat it as like bonus time. Or it was like, I, can, I will have a different appreciation for my freedom than I ever had. But you know how our brains work. We normalize things real fast. And I think in our world, when you're forced into a period in which you have to choose to get better or not, you make a clear choice. But in a normal day-to-day -day interaction, when most of us are comfortable and free and in a routine, we do not give, our, give ourselves that space. We do not give ourselves that option. I even know I did not, I did not like no longer struggle with depression and anxiety because I now had a new appreciation of my freedom. I'm sure I could in some way, but like it didn't just automatically happen. I'm curious if you have found the ability to maintain that focus on personal growth after you've been out for six or seven years. I would say that I have been able to maintain it, but not to the same degree, huh. for sure. Um, it, it's just, it's different. I think with with less distractions and, and the the amount of focus that, that you have, the, the amount of capabilities of focus in there, regardless of all the BS happening, like when you're in a fucking eight by 10 cell and all you have is you and your celly, because this is what it, I ended up getting to at some point um, when I paroled from Folsom, California, um, the amount of focus is just, it, it's, it's unmatched. There's and nothing else to do. There's just nothing else to do. Like you're all, all day. Imagine just studying all day in a little bathroom. Yeah. You don't even have TikTok. <laughs> there's yeah. nothing. There's nothing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's unmatched. But when you know that there's no way that you can get, you know, distracted, you can't go out to yeah. a restaurant. You can't go, you know, even take a walk in the park, whatever, uh, you kind of, it escapes you like that is like, ah, oh, well you can either envision this, oh, I want to be doing this and kind of take your, your mind there and, and just stress yourself out because you can't do it. Or you just focus on what you have right in front of you. So that aside, like, yeah, it's very different. I have been able to maintain it to a certain degree, um, because of the natures of, of my business and just wanting to become a better leader and, better husband, better person overall. I think I, I, you know, there's some habits that I've maintained. Um, but there is something that you mentioned in terms of um, kind of that monotony, right? That breaking, you're kind of getting stuck in this cycle of just doing the same thing. What I've done is every year, and this is more for the health side, but I, I found that it also has helped me with just overall progressing as a human being, is putting myself into adversity. And the way that I do that is a five-day fast. So every year I start off the year with a five-day mm. fast. And that kind of breaks the cycle because it's like attaching to something that's hard and difficult for most people to do. And that has been able to help me maintain a lot of that. And then aside from, from uh, you know, the, the health benefits, the, the mental clarity and everything that comes with that has been really... Uh... F funny you say that because my version of adversity is getting up at 5.30 in the morning. It's like, it is the last thing I want to do. <laughs> but it's almost like when I do it, which is not every day, but when I do it, it is almost like... I have proven to myself that I can do something hard mm -hmm. and therefore I can block out that time for whatever it is that I'm procrastinating or I right. can have that hard conversation with a team member. Like when I prove to myself that I can deal with adversity versus being glued to my phone for three hours right? where now I have no capacity to deal with anything hard because I've just been dripping my brain with dopamine. It is a vastly different human experience. Uh, so Julian, you were you were in there for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. You got out. You're starting over. I don't know what they give you, if anything. I'm pretty sure you didn't have any job opportunities coming right out. 
So what was the transition coming out into the world? When I first got out, it was a month of twiddling my thumbs, looking for an opportunity that um, was kind of promised to me. Uh, I think the first opportunity was in becoming a plumber and I was kind of waiting for the call, I guess you could say. Um, and during that time, I saw my first Facebook ad. <laughs> so <laughs> good old Ty Lopez. <laughs> um, that it's, it's an important part of the story because when I, that, it happened so fast, like right when I got out, like I saw that there was this whole other world of, of, of making money, um, that never existed before. Uh, did you have any awareness that this existed while you were in prison? No, I, I, I didn't know that internet marketing was a thing, but I was interested in marketing because like the last, I'd say like the last, um, really that, that last year is when I, I tripled down on trying to figure out what I was going to do when I got out to the point where I started stressing myself out. Like the last three months, I wrote this whole journal called the hundred days of freedom every day. I just wanted to at least journal my inner thoughts, what was going on, the things I was struggling with. And, um, I, I just, you know, just did a one page journal every single day. Um, along with my, my by the way, courses. that would be a freaking great <clears throat> first product for Beyond Driven. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually getting to where I'm going to release it. A, a hundred days of freedom because <laughs> everybody's in prison somewhere. Yeah, I know. Right, I everybody's know. trapped in their thoughts and their minds. A hundred. That's it'd it's be a, a good, good challenge. Huh? It's a challenge. really good hook, Julian. I appreciate it. Yeah. So don't be surprised when it okay. Goes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um. Yeah. So I, I, w I was really struggling with like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? Like, man, I feel stressed. I, I don't want to come back to this place. And it was like really eating me up. And it got down to the last week. And I said, I just felt like this peace finally. It was just lifted. I was praying on it. And I was just finally okay. Like no matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to be so good at what I do mm. that I'm undeniable. Mm. I'm going to have blind conviction to this vision that no one else can see except for me. And that was the core belief that I held. And I just took a deep breath, tears just coming down my, my cheek. I said, you know what? I'm going to be okay. And I know it's going to be hard. I know, I know there's going to be times where I feel like giving up. I know that so many people are going to doubt me and just embracing the fact that like, that is part of the journey. Yeah. And that is part of what makes someone great is that they're able to go through these and to to look back at, at everything they've been to been through up to that point. I just knew that that was this was going to be part. I I just I felt like that was going to be part of my story, and it's just crazy. Like it just hit me like, damn, like I'm here. Yeah, you know. And uh, it's. That was really how it, how it ended, man. It is is those those final days in 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 jail is just committing to a path that I had no idea what it was going to look like, but just knowing that I was committing to that path. And and then God or or Satan brought you Ty Lopez, depending <laughs> on who you ask. What, what, depending what, what on who you ask. Yeah. But it was it was knowledge at the end. Yeah. Of <laughs> so so what you bought sixty seven steps way back in the day, or I, what? what did, where did this go? <laughs> well, actually. Um, I ended up getting a construction job, but that was what planted the seed of what was possible, that people were making a thousand, you know, tens of thousands of dollars online by just helping people with social media. I'm like, what the fuck? So I just knew, like, I have to get my job to appease to my, um, my parole officer during that time. But I also wanted to look at this as, like, a, an opportunity for me to expand in different ways. So... Got my construction job. It was a strong, solid foundation. It was, um, I was living in Sacramento during the time. It was in San Francisco, the job. So it paid well, but that commute was a bitch. It was an hour, hour and a half um, to get there in the morning. Not bad. But after work, we get out at like 2, 2.30 uh, for construction. You're like in the heart of San Francisco mm -hmm. traffic going back to Sacramento. So it would take about three sometimes even four hours wow. to commute back. So during those times from, you know, commuting there and back uh, from work, those are the hours that I put into YouTube and to different, you know, um, article, different videos that I can find mostly on YouTube 
uh, that I can find online in all things digital marketing. So I started, you know, looking into affiliate marketing, e-commerce. Um, I saw some of your stuff. I, I'm pretty sure really? during that time. Yeah. Cool. I, um, but it was more so like Adrian Morrison and, and like just different guys in, in the like all affiliate marketing space as well. Um, and it planted this like Ty Lopez planted the seed, but I started to actually take action. I said, I said you know, I, it's, it's one thing to just consume a lot of information, but there has to be a point where you just fucking dive in and just accept that, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fail forward. I'm going to make some mistakes, probably look stupid. And, and there was this large learning curve, but this is again, just reminding myself of that saying that I said, like, this is, this is it. This is part of the path. I got to learn something new again. So, um, I didn't buy 67 steps, but I found like a, a torrent, a torrent. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And, uh, you know, I started with that I started watching those things and I found some more torrents on like SEO and different things like that. So I just started just like, you just consumed everything that you could about marketing, everything I could about marketing. And I, the first dollar that I made online was affiliate marketing found this website called uh, wealthy affiliate and I made uh they taught me how to set up my own blog and everything like that and do you know that I was a super affiliate for wealthy affiliate no I traveled with Carson <laughs> oh my went to the Vegas meetups <laughs> met my mentor Travis there wow yeah I was just, I was a top three affiliate for wealthy affiliate for years wow that's yeah. probably where I first saw your picture then. that is wild <laughs> damn that's, that's great. wild yeah, so they, you know, they taught me, they had great information. So they taught me uh, how to set up a blog. And I thought it was a, a genius idea to write a blog of a re- of reviewing Ty Lopez course. Yeah. So I didn't even have the course, but I had the torrent. Yeah, you had the info. <laughs> and I had the info. So I basically, uh, I took screenshots from the torrent and like left out like the the torrent, like yeah. red mark or whatever, <laughs> and was putting that in the blog. So, it, you know, just kind of given my whole summary and at the bottom was like, you know, this is a great opportunity, but this is a better opportunity. And this is how you can get started. And that was my first dollar that wow. I made online was through something like that posted the links on Quora and, you know, I was like starting to make a little bit of, I felt like, you know, it was progress. It wasn't really traction, yeah, yeah. but it was progress. It was a step in the right direction. Um, and with that, I started also like, oh, I know how to set up a simple blog and website. So I started selling web design services, which I will never, ever do. <laughs> yeah. So that was, I got like two clients there and I started selling, um, I was like, man, let me let me try to just sell a service and like outsource that work to someone else because I don't I, I know how to sell, but I don't know how to uh, really do all this work yet. I'm so still that, learning. That's like the beginning of your operations background. And yeah, that so was like, that was the beginning you, of yeah. The, you, you like learned all these skills, right? Which yeah. is which is often the first two years of any entrepreneurial experience. Yeah, so you're you just getting these the skills. skills. Yeah, and you then learn that you can bring other people on to do everything else. So you stay in your zone. Is this what led you to meet Wes and Michael? Like how did those connections start to happen? So it went on like this, you know, getting random projects for about six months or whatever. Wasn't really making much money. It was a side job. And then I finally started an agency where I niched down. Um, around the same time, I got very, very sick. I was out for like a month like Crohn's disease and after that time I quit my job uh doing construction it was just taking a toll on my body I just couldn't I couldn't do it um I had already helped my wife get her business established so we're living off of her income but Mm. she was doing lash extension so we were okay during that time your wife sounds like a saint by the way she is she's she's uh she's been a rock and she's been man it's it's uh it's been a blessing that she came into my life um, but so, so you started, you started doing clients, you end up meeting or looking for people who have the it factor. I, that didn't come for a while, man. It, it really didn't. So I niched down and, and I had this traditional agency where I was helping gym owners to get new members. Like gym launch was like my, like 
oh, I want, I want to, you want to, you want to be, be hormozy too? Yeah. I want to be, <laughs> who doesn't want to, right? Um, so it, it was like, that was like, oh, I, I think I can do it better than this guy. <laughs> so I started chasing that. Right. And, uh, with like the traditional agency and then my business partner who I met in prison, uh, he ended up getting out and we reconnected through a Facebook message, which he's, <laughs> I still have the message, but he was like, I don't know if this message went through or not. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when I saw that message, I called him, we connected, whatever. And, um, he he was friends with Wes like for 15 years or so uh they've been friends so they were friends before they got locked up they stayed in communication during the time they were locked up I would already have this uh stab kind of established agency it was doing over it was like 15k a month 10 15k a month um and I was bringing him into this picture because I he's has a way with words, really good at talking to people. I was like, you can at least start selling mm -hmm. for me because I hate the sales side of things, and I'll just build and do marketing stuff. And um, that's really how it started. And then he was like, hey, I have this guy that he's he has a he just got out of prison. He has a good message. And he's just holding his phone and just recording these these stories on Instagram. Um, and that was Wes Watson. Yeah. And we should probably go and talk to him. I was like, oh, it's it's online fitness. Like I've never mm -hmm. done like a fully online fitness thing before. And he's like, well, it might be worth the conversation. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Let's let's go talk to him. So we met at Panera in San Diego. And uh <clears throat> It, he was he was just basically in his phone the whole time <laughs> but uh we went over you know um basically how he can get monetized and like how we can start expanding his brand so and I, I i just need to tap on something here because most people wouldn't have taken that meeting with a tattooed up out of prison guy who's on his phone the whole time right but you had a connection to him and you needed the opportunity and now that that person has gone on to be one of the most recognized people in our space and people are sometimes confused as to how i can have such a long-term view on our members who are starting get their first thousand dollars in sales in a membership or somebody who is just starting to create content on the internet and it's because i've seen this story play out enough times to where a few of those people who break out are going to have a $10 million business or are going to have a million person following. And when you know that and you show up to the meeting with the guy with 5,000 followers and you can see that he has it, it gives you a different lens than when you're just looking for something to work out right now. Yeah. So that is just such a beautiful example of there was a relationship that started with nothing, right? Like you have a small agency and a partner, and he's got 5,000 followers. And it becomes this huge thing that most people in our space recognize. And that is, that's what I mean when I say, I believe that things tend to get better. Because we tend to look at our current situation and forecast that out forever without ever saying, how big can this get? Or this will tend to grow over time. But when you know that, you can kind of relax. Right. Relax in the sense of like, I don't have to worry about it all going away. Like something in my sphere of influence is going to pop, is going to take off. It takes like, a lot of belief right there. Well, like what a good example of it, of yeah. you working with Wes. And then that work moves over to Francis and all the other guys that you've worked with. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a part of it too is he just got onto a podcast uh, it was like a YouTube interview similar to this with uh, this guy, Big Herc, who already had a pretty large following too, and it was starting to pick up very fast. And this is like we had the interview, this or we had the the meeting. Like I met him for the first time on that same day, and it started to pick up. I'm like, oh, I'm seeing the traction already here, and then I'm already just seeing that it, it's the direction that it is that social media was going during that time is people who are willing to to really put their their story out there 
it doesn't have to be as raw and polarizing during that time as as west was but just being consistent with it that was enough during yeah. that time you know this was back in what 2019 or something like that um and i just didn't want to do that yeah <laughs> like, it could have been you know probably could have been me like i just i just didn't have that courage i mean i guess you could say it to to just be consistent enough with putting my story out there i just i just never really liked social media and i was like how can i get someone who actually likes to post social uh, post on social and i could just build behind them so that was another aspect to it too how did you end up monetizing that audience because i know that that playbook has moved over to a lot of the different guys that you work with mm -hmm. now. So with Wes, he already had some coaching clients. He was charging like $50 a month, $100 a month, something like that. So he was making about uh, $2,500, maybe $3,000 a month. So you already had like a baseline core offer. Like, okay, at least somebody, somebody is taking their wallet out and they're saying, yes, I want to pay you for something. So it was a starting place. It was somewhere that let's just do more of this. Yeah. You know, and obviously we can adjust the pricing. We can, you know, that's the easiest way for you to grow your business is just by doubling how much you're actually charging because you're really not charging enough right here. And then starting to look at like, how are you delivering this? You know, how can we make this in a way that is going to be scalable? Because whenever I look at, you know, a, a start, a business that's getting started, I'm like, okay, how can we take what we have here and not have to change it too much to where we can actually scale this to $10 million without doing much more, except for just marketing and sales. And it's like that, that's like the, I'd say like actually like 5 million, one to 5 million. And then from five to 10 is like, now you have to get some real leaders in the business and operations a little bit different. But I'm always thinking with that lens of like scale. How can I set this up for scale? So I don't have to just go and break things consistently. Um, so I just, I started with, without even having the experience at that point, like I'm, I was still like gym owners running ads for mm -hmm. them. Like I didn't really have that experience, but I knew the thought process that I needed to like the lens in which I needed to be viewing it. And I just, I, I felt confident in myself to learn the skills that I needed to be able to bring that when needed, you know? Uh, so there's a lot that I had to learn and there's a lot that I got to try when we effectively launched, I guess you could say, uh, Watson Fit. I mean, we did the whole branding, the first initial funnels, everything. I mean, everything when it came to the foundation of of, of getting that brand off, off the ground. Um, and, you know, it just really came down to starting with the foundational pieces of, of making an online business. I'm curious... From your perspective, there's a, there's some people who think that if I just get an influencer to work with me, my business will change. And to some aspect, that's true. Like some some respect, that can be very effective. But there's another side to working with people with audiences too. So what have you seen be the benefits and the challenges of working with people who have influence? I think there's a lot on both sides. Um, we'll start with the challenges. So the challenges are, it depends, it, like it's a status play. So there's, there's going to be some people that you approach that have a large influence and they don't even want to listen to anything you have to say because they're purely focused on, you know, does this person like, are, are we on the same page? And they, they kind of have a, an like, elevated, do we have the same status? Do they, yeah, yeah, do we have the same status? And that is often determined by follower count. And it's often determined yeah. by follower count. So <laughs> the answer nine times out of 10 is going to be no. Um, so it's it's it starts off the relationship with an uphill battle if you're already approaching someone that has a large following. In the case of Wes, we had commonality. We had a lot of things that we, um, our values aligned when it came to, you know, first of all, our background, you know, us we're both criminals so we both, we both uh connected on that sense and there's like this unwritten rule that comes to just like the handshake of respect on a baseline level um that was the foundation of our 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 you know arrangement um but getting aside from Wes um I'd say some of the the other challenges just come with 
when you grow so fast, whether this is just an influencer or just overall people who are getting a lot of money at a very fast rate, you, I'd say from the influencer realm, there's a lot of praise and a lot of um, positive reinforcement from an audience that can tend to make the influencer kind of have an influ an inflated um um uh, what's view the, of themselves not really that's one part but it's also um them doing the right taking the right actions or um thinking that they comprehend certain business ah. foundations is like well i'm getting all this praise and i'm earning all this money so i must be really good at doing these things but it's it, it's not necessarily true just because you have a large following you and you're making a lot of money doesn't mean that you're you're really skilled at business it, so that becomes challenging when you start to scale a business um because there could be conflicting views and also the lack of willingness to to kind of give up some control and at every point this this happens with non-influencer business too uh businesses too is that there's comes a point in an entrepreneur journey where you have to give up control if you want to scale and you, you tend to be the core bottleneck in a lot of cases whether that's at a million dollars five million dollars ten million dollars um or maybe you're you know um um the the uber ceo and you get you're able to scale it to a ten billion dollar plus business, but then years he was the bottleneck at the end of the day. You know, there there's comes a, a point where it's like this the the head person, if they can't give up more control, then they gotta go. They gotta go. Cause yeah. it's hurting the business. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges when it comes to influencer based businesses is they have this inflated ego um that can give them this false sense of like comprehension. I, I, I understand just, that. Yeah. 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 Um but aside from that, I, I would say there's not really. I mean, that's just business business partnerships that's just all together. People. You know, that's just people. That's just human beings. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if that's like the influencer side of things. Um, but on, then, the, on the positive side, on the positive as they side, grow, as they grow, it it's exponential. So when you have an audience that is committed <laughs> yeah and bought in and bought in yeah is bought in there is room for failure there's room for making mistakes and you can you can do you can launch a shitty product and still do well you can you can be off on on the uh the operation side and um, you know, not being able to um, really scale the marketing or the sales side really well as a you would need on any other circumstance and still do great. Yeah. And you can do this with limited ad spin. It just makes it so much easier to launch things. It makes it so much easier to prove concept because you can just post and get a ton of feedback and just like, what the fuck? This is such a blessing for me to actually get this this live feedback and, and interaction with a, with an audience that is hungry, and now I can go and create instead of like going into this research and development phase and then bringing it to market and yep. ah no this and isn't guessing the and then guessing yeah. right so you kind of it just it's a fast track to being able to prove concept and scale a business. I want to close by asking you a question that my followers often ask me which is how big of an audience do you need in order to do damage? So you worked with influencers that were really at the very beginning, but you built seven and eight figure companies with these guys. So at what point do you have an audience in which you can knock over the first domino? It's not the size of the boat. It's the motion of the ocean. Yes. <laughs> I say it differently. It's, it's not the size of the audience. It's the intimacy you have with them. Yeah, it, yeah. it absolutely is. And that, I mean, that, that saying, it rings true in, in the audience side. I mean, it's just, you yeah, can do you have, damage with someone with an audience that's pretty small, but they are just hanging on to every yeah. word that you say. If you have 200 people who watch everything and send it to their friends, 
you can do damage. You can do damage. Because yeah. now one message is going to pop to right. the right people. And those 200 people will buy your stuff yeah. or support your launch or leave you a review or whatever action you want them to take. That's enough. Right. And when you realize how few people you need, oh man, I think that frees you up to go into give mode. People are surprised. I was talking with a friend yesterday where I was like, how many opt-ins a day are you getting? And he's like, I'm only getting like five opt-ins a day. I was like, okay, I have a challenge for you. For the next 30 days, I want you to take 50 minutes and I want you to do five minutes of research and make a five-minute video for every one of those five people that are coming in. Five minutes of research, find they opt in with their email address, find their social media, and then go make them a five-minute video just showing what recommendations you would give them based on what you found through your lens of experience. That's it. And for 30 days, you have 150 people. Is that right? 150 people who you have delivered five minutes of intentional value to. It will take you 50 minutes a day for 30 days. Watch how fast your business changes. Because you can do some crazy numbers with 150 people that you've delivered a lot of value for. Most people just won't take the 10 minutes to do it. I totally agree. And that's it. You're building assets, especially if you do it in a way that like you can repurpose it in different ways too. That's right. You know, that's right. you can put those into case studies. You can create different content out of that. But you're right. I mean, most people just aren't willing to do that work and they're looking at the wrong metrics to say, oh, well, when I get to this point, then my business will grow. No, your business will grow if you just put the work in. Julian, what a story, man. Congratulations on everything you've done. Uh, thanks for being an example. Like this, I really received this idea of carving out the intentional time to become a better person because it's so alluring to just fall into the trap of the same thing every day, and most people do that. And that's a really good reminder. You're a really good example of just how much can change if you carve out that intentional time every day. Thank you for being an example. Thank you for coming out the other side, a better person. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having Good me. Good to see you. Good to see you. I love sharing transformation stories like this on the podcast because there are still times that I feel like I'm behind. There are still times that I feel like I'm starting over. To some extent, we are always starting over. We're always starting a new chapter. And hearing the stories like Julian, where he got out of prison, was starting completely over and became a very powerful entrepreneur reminds me that if we give our focus and our attention to whatever it is that we want and we work like hell for a few years, there is no upper limit. There is no ceiling. Even though I've had my shares of successes, there are still times that I doubt myself. There are still times that I feel behind. There are still times that I feel like I'm not where I want to be. And when I hear how quickly life can turn around from people who have dealt with much more adversity than me, it reminds me how much time all of us have and how quickly our lives can turn around. It also makes me grateful for everything that I've accomplished up to this point and makes me excited about the things that we can accomplish together as a community over the next few years. If you're at the beginning of a new chapter, if you're starting over, if you feel like you're behind, our work here is helping entrepreneurs build seven-figure businesses that they can sell. The process usually takes about 12 months. We have hundreds of case studies of people who have built seven-figure businesses. You can find the resources to get started around this video. And I just want you to know that I consider it a privilege to be a part of your journey. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for liking and subscribing. Thank you for sharing all of your success stories with me. Seeing those transformations makes me feel like all of this work is worth it. Appreciate you guys. I'll see you on the next episode. Take care.